I learned to speak German. And uh, when we came back to Canada, I actually nearly failed grade one because I spoke with such a heavy German accent that the teacher could not understand me. So, but I had nobody to speak German to, so I actually lost the language growing up, uh, not speaking there. So when we were in Germany, my mom grew up as a seven day best, and I'll, I'll segue into that story um, afterwards. Uh, but when she married, who was not a seven day best, but who's mother and brother were, um, she uh, kind of, you know, moving to Germany, there wasn't very many English speaking people around. So she stopped going to church. But when we came back to Ottawa, uh, where my dad was stationed in uh, at the nation's capital there, uh, she started returning. And um, there was a pastor there called Glenn Corkum, and he just passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, he... Um, Baptized my mom, rebaptized her, and then I was a little kid there. And by a chain of events, he baptized my father, my brother, and I was the last person to be baptized at the church there before he moved off to Windsor, Ontario. Uh, but he was a very great man. My dad eventually left the church, but before he passed away, through a miracle of God, he came back. So it was a, it was neat to see God work. My my brother left the Lord's side for a while. Um, became a, a, a very strong alcoholic. And my mom and I prayed for my brother. And one day, um, my brother was driving drunk and he hit a lady and almost killed her. Took a year to learn to walk again. But I, I, I remember my mom and I praying and I remember questioning God, saying, God, what are you doing here? And um, God basically whispered back, let me do what I need to do. Well, it was in jail there that my brother, I don't, uh, you know, I'm a big man. I'm six foot four, a little bit under 300 pounds. Uh, my brother was six feet tall, around 400 pounds. He was a big guy, big beard, looked like a biker. But he snored really, really loud. And he got sentenced to three months in prison. And so when they put him in there um, in jail, he snored so loud, he kept everybody in his cell block awake. No. The next day, the you know um, a motorcycle gang members by um, the name of Hell's Angels came up to him and said, "Is that you snoring, Robert?" And he goes, "Yeah." Said, "If you snore tonight, we're going to slice your throat because they were in a dormitory like a cell." And so that night, my brother stayed awake all night. He said, "I'm not sleeping. I'll sleep during the day and and uh, stay awake and read at night." First night was okay. Second night he struggled. By the third night, he couldn't do it anymore. But it was God's working because he said a prayer and he said, Lord, if you don't get me out of here, I'm going to die here in jail. So the next morning, as he was tired and everybody else was waking up, the guard came down and said, Rob, you're wanted in the warden's office. And so my brother came into the warden's office, sat down, and the warden looked at him and said, Rob, you're an alcoholic, aren't you? And he goes, yes, I, I am. That's why I'm here, drunk driving. And he said, I also hear there's a death threat on you. He goes, yeah, there is. He goes, it's because of my snoring. He says, I don't like people being killed in my jail here. And he said, if I parole you today, would you promise to go to a counselor that's a friend of mine? And my brother said, yes, what's the conditions? He said, you go to her twice a week for the remainder of your sentence. And then once a week after that, he says, I'll parole you right now. My brother walked out of the jail that day and happened to go to a lady that was a Christian counselor. And through her counseling and through all that she was saying, she, she kept on directing Rob to the higher power, which was God. And it changed my brother's life. A few years later, he was uh, rebaptized. He stopped drinking, never drank after that jail experience. That was but it was just amazing to watch God work on my whole family in bringing us back, you know, one by one through different means. You know, I had my time as a teenager, you know, uh, doing the drug years and stuff like that. And it's just amazing how God reached my brother, myself, my dad, uh, my mom coming back from Germany. 
But I just, I'm here today because God did an amazing work on my family. And even my father, I, I, I prayed, I said, Lord, don't let my father close his eyes till he knows you. And about three months before he passed away from kidney disease, um, he had a, a lady that had just been stationed at his uh, home, uh, assisted living, who happened to have been a chaplain. And she would visit my dad every night at 10 o'clock and talk to about midnight about God. And it was an amazing thing that my dad was in a hospice and it was a week before he passed away and he just looked at me and he said, Paul, thank you for leading me back to the Lord. And I just turned my head and I said, what? <laughs> so it was just neat to see that, that God gave me that experience. Sorry, that's a lot uh, in a question, but. Well, you, know. you were just talking about, uh, it was amazing to see how God works in situations sometimes. It looks so bad that we don't know how it's all going to come out the other way. So my second question is along those lines, really, I think. Um, in your day-to-day -day ministry, as you encounter people along the way, uh, you know, what is your observation? Do you see people searching for answers, seeking God, you know, uh, praying for revival? Or do you see the church laxed in their walk, just going with the flow, you know? that's a it's a mixed question because i was just at a church in montreal uh this past um uh sabbath uh the few days before i was at the north american division and we were talking about how many young people young adults had left our church and it was basically a plea from the youth department to the union presidents we really have to work on reclaiming our youth and young adults mm -hmm. and bringing them back to the lord bringing them back in and reaching their friends and it was it was a very discouraging um, time that we had because uh, because of COVID we probably lost about 40 percent of our young adults and probably that percentage of our our youth too and but on Sabbath I, I came to a church I was invited to the church by uh, one of our um, members who's a member on the North American Division Board and I walked into the church and I was kind of taken back because I saw young people everywhere. The gentleman that was uh, teaching Sabbath school was a young adult. All the people that were coming to the microphone to have an incredible, interesting discussion on tithing were young adults. Very few, ad uh, you know, older adults coming to the microphone and participating. And so that was really encouraging to be at a church where I saw so many young adults. After the week before, we just had meetings, you know, how are we going to reclaim them? So yeah. there are some churches that, that uh, I see that God is working very strongly in. Um, the church that I was baptized in in Ottawa uh, is, is right now planting two churches. And they're growing. I walked into the church there a few weeks ago to speak for the school's 50th anniversary, because that's where I first started going to a seven-day event school. And it was packed. And it was multicultural. It was a beautiful experience. Uh, to be there and the church is growing but I'm worried about rural Canada because in the rural places our churches are closing and uh, you know I pastored in uh, in uh, in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia and I was the president of the conference out there and we're closing down a lot of our rural churches one by one they're just uh, uh, Nobody is coming to church anymore. The, the medium age is 85. And so we're closing them down. So that, that's one area that really I, I'm concerned about. And I, we pray a lot about is how to bring the work back to rural Canada and also to, uh, to revive our churches. Because uh, I think we're very comfortable in our walk with God or what we call our walk with God. And uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine that runs... Uh, Lifestyles Canada, which is our, our literature evangelism across Canada. And at his church, he said, we're doing an evangelistic crusade in the spring. And he said, it's a church of 130. And he said, I can't find a single person to volunteer to help out in the crusade. And so oh. you, you have difficulties like that. Uh, you know, we, we need, we need God to, to do something, uh, a lot of times we think, okay, we, we have to do something, but I think God is already there. He's working in our church. Mm -hmm. I do say these words very carefully. It says the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. 
but we also pass over the first part means the harvest is great means God's doing something out there. Uh, even as feeble as we are sometimes as a church, God is still working through us. We're still witnessing. We're still sharing our faith with other people. So when the harvest time comes, he says the harvest is great. And he says the workers are free. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to, to send workers into the field. Uh, that's, his, that's his job. God's going to do that. Yeah. But it tells me that there's something going on in our world today, that God's people are sharing the gospel. Uh, within our church and and in other places around the world, um, we're sharing the gospel in different ways. And so I, I believe there's going to be a great harvest. And that's going to amaze us because right now we're looking and going, you know, uh, 1,500 baptisms um, throughout Canada last year. That's not an awful lot. Uh, that's a large, huge, mega, well, large mm-hmm. church. But we have churches that are shrinking. Uh, we have many member, members that are passing away. So. We might be growing in baptisms in one end, but when we look at the other end, we are shrinking. Looking forward now, and I don't know, maybe you're going to touch on this in your whatever you're sharing, but yes. what do you see as the vision for the church of 2023 and beyond? Um, is it going to be the same old, same old, or are we are we really preparing for the coming of, of Jesus? You know, what's what's the message for the hour? Well, you know, when I go to meetings, and a lot of my job is meetings, uh, I go to the general conference meetings, uh, talking with Ted Wilson, and uh, we're in committees together. But I really see the general conference saying we need to get very serious about sp- spreading the everlasting gospel through the three angels message. So I see that, that that the push from the general conference is very strong for worldwide. Then I go to the North American division. And it is a very strong push too. We have three M's that the North American division has, which is uh, media, multiply, and mentorship. Uh, we need to really focus on media because people aren't reading these days. They, they pick up their cell phone and this is their media. Uh, yeah. We need to be multiplying our church and how to multiply. And then we also need to be mentoring our young people to take places uh, because when I go to meetings, mostly gray-haired people are at those meetings. And I, we need to see more young people there. And so um, at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada, since the North American division has three M's, we're also working on their three M's. Because why do something different when our overreaching entity is going this way? We want to go the same direction. So in Canada, we're working also on the three M's. Our... our um, media is this year we are launching hope channel canada mm-hmm. and we hope to have uh, to start with seven hours of television uh throughout the day and go to full 24 hours within a year or two where all the content is canadian content it's for canada it's to reach the, our, our, our personalized context uh from from newfoundland all the way to bc to the northern territories that we have here in canada and uh, we're doing that very strongly. It is, it is going, we're putting a lot into that uh, to get Hope Channel Canada off the ground. It is written, Canada will come under it. And also Ella Decree, which is our French version of it, uh, it is written, will come under that. And we want to make sure that that is available on every television carrier uh, for people to watch but also through the internet uh, so that people can do it through Roku or whatever means. But we want to make sure we have a strong television network in Canada that can bring the gospel message right into the homes. Uh, Hope Channel French, which most of the programming comes from Quebec uh, right now, is having incredible uh, reach in our French-speaking countries around the world. So much so that Ella Decree, it is written French uh, in Quebec, Uh, Their donations have gone up from non-SDAs 475% in the last year. So Hope Channel French is really reaching the world. And we want Hope Channel Canada to reach Canada. So that's one of our three M's. The next one is um, multiply. There's two aspects we're going to focus on in Canada over the next five years. One, we would like to uh, plant a young adult church in every uh, um, conference in Canada and do that repeatedly because young adult churches tend to grow in 10 years to a normal church but we want to be doing that we want to reclaim our young adults that have left 
the, the number is many and it's easier to reclaim those who we've lost than to go out to brand new people. And if we reclaim our lost um, uh, young adults, they bring with them their friends. And so they're not coming alone. They, they come with a huge influence. So we're really gonna be working on that. And the other thing is we're gonna be working through ADRA to train our churches across Canada. I know we, we look at ADRA and said, okay, what can we do for you know, helping our communities or helping in an emergency? But we wanna make sure ADRA is training our churches to go to our communities, to see what the needs are in our communities so that our churches become part of the community and become so involved in the community that the community starts to take an interest in what we have to say and what we believe. And then the last one is mentorship. Uh, we need, we have a shortage of young adults. Right now, the Mansas Conference is looking for a youth director. They've had seven names that we've given them, turn them down. We have a lack of leadership in Canada. Usually when we're picking a president in one of our conferences, we would come with seven or eight names. Usually in the past uh, um, few sessions we've had, we come with two names because there's uh, not very many wanting to go into leadership. And a lot of our leaders are retiring and we don't have a lot of young people that are moving along in there. So you'll see us at the SDACC sponsoring scholarships for educators to go to Berman sponsoring scholarships for people taking theology to go there and business administration because we need uh, accountants. So we're really doing a, a large push to make sure we're getting workers into our schools, into our churches, uh, but also preparing our churches to reach our communities. So it seems to me that uh, we need to get serious and be in prayer a lot. Yes. I'm, I'm, a I'm, lot. Yeah. I believe in prayer. In fact, that's what I'm speaking on because Usually Wednesday night is called prayer meeting. And so That's I right. love and to so, see um, So just, be, just before you speak, uh, we, we usually have somebody pray for our speaker. All right. And uh, we have one of our elders, and that's Agnes, and she is going to uh, pray for you. And is there anything that she can pray for you that you need prayer for tonight? Or Yes. My son lives in Esquimalt. Ah, and I would like you to pray for him. So does my he's son. He's in the military, and uh, uh, I would love for him to have that walk with God that he wants. Okay. And my daughter, too. Well, before I, uh, I have prayer, I was wanting to ask oh, you hi, about... Hi. Oh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> so I wanted to see if you recognize my name or not. But yes, I do. Do you remember Crawford Advanced Academy? I sure do. <laughs> Which years were you there? Um, as a as a student, I was there from seventy five or seventy six to um, well, I dropped out for two years to go to public school, and I graduated in eighty four, eighty five from Kingsway, and then I went back to teach at Crawford two different times, uh, ah. but for a total of eight years. See, I I know you from that time. Uh, I was in the I call it basement with the kindergarten and the science room. Were you into journalism or were you into taking pictures for the yearbook? Yes, or something? I, I did. I was the photographer and uh, also at Andrews University, I was the photographer for the student movement. Ah, that's how I remember you. Yes. You're running around with the photography uh, team and you're yeah. taking pictures for the yearbook. And uh, my son, Daniel, when he was seeing your picture in the bulletin, he said, oh, I know him. <laughs> he was there too. And my other son as well, Vincent as well. So it's so good to see you again. Seems like a long time. I was there from 1980 to 1999. So there were four years overlapping. I couldn't remember how many years were overlapping that I, that we were in the same school for that reason. <laughs> so good to see you again and welcome to our prayer meeting. Thank you. Um, I like to uh, start with prayer now. So let's bow our head for prayer, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the many, many blessings that you have given us. And Lord, we ask today a blessing on Pastor Llewellyn as he leads out in our country as the president of SDACC. Lord, we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide him in his ministry, a very important ministry in our country. Watch over him, be with his family as well, Lord especially with his son who is in his quiet in the military and his daughter 
We ask that you uh, send holy angels by their side and the Holy Spirit to uh, let them walk closer and closer to you. Lord, as we starting this prayer meeting, we ask as well that, Lord, we get a blessing from the many ways that you have revealed yourself to Pastor Llewellyn, and that we in return may find a blessing from this prayer meeting. We ask this all in your name, Lord. Amen. Uh, well, if if you know me, if anybody knows me, my um, my passion for for when I speak is usually on prayer. I I do have a uh, unpublished book on my this computer that I need need to uh, get going to publish. But uh, I love speaking on prayer, just because prayer was always a powerful part of my life. And growing up, um, I want to tell you a story my grandmother uh, used to tell me. Uh, my grandmother was born in the country of Estonia, and uh, while there, she had three children. She had a husband named Robert, which was my brother's name. Uh, and when the war broke out in, in Europe, uh, Estonia was a port city that had a lot of um, battles going on because the uh, Russian army wanted uh, the port city of Tallinn, and also the German army wanted the port city of Tallinn. And uh, as the war escalated and Russians came in and the Germans came in, they fought back and forth uh, for, the, for the country of Estonia. Um, my grandfather worked for the Estonian secret police. And what they would do is go out on boats and they were, would receive the shortwave radio messages uh, that were coming in from Russia and from Germany. And they spoke both Russian and German uh, and translate it to see where... Estonia could best prepare. The Estonians actually like the Germans a lot better uh, because when the Germans came in, they were pretty respectful of the Estonian people. Uh, yes, there were certain people that went missing, but for the great majority of uh, the Estonians, they got along very well with the Germans. The German soldiers would actually come and knock on your door every night to make sure that you were okay, that you have enough rations, uh, that everybody, that nobody was bothering you, especially if you were single or a single parent, uh, they would do that. Uh, the communist army, and I do have Russian blood in me, uh, the communist army was a little bit different. And uh, my great grandparents were, were killed during the war at that time. So uh, the Estonian secret police preferred that the Germans would invade uh, permanently because they were better off that. Now, the Estonians wanted their sovereignty back, but they knew that during the war, it wasn't possible. Um, but my grandfather being on that ship, the Germans uh, were very suspicious of the ship that he was on. And one day they bombed that ship. And my grandfather was killed. In the middle of the night, my grandmother woke up. She just basically just had this sense from God that her husband had been killed at sea. And sure enough, two weeks later, she got word that he had been killed. And it was the exact night she woke up. So there she was caring for three kids. Uh, my mother who was nine, my aunt, who was eight, and my uncle, who was about 13 or 14 at that time. And it was very hard. Uh, the Germans came to her and said, listen, you have an apartment, three bedroom apartment. Since um, the Russians are bombing so many apartments out here, you'll have to rent out two rooms and live in one room. So they did that. And the Germans found two ladies that worked for the German army and they lived there. So uh, when the Germans would come by to date the ladies that were there, they would bring extra rations for my grandmother so that uh, she would have extra butter, extra sugar, extra flour, and things like that. So it was actually beneficial for her. But one day, one of the German officers came to her and said, Helmi, you need to get out of the country because we can't hold on. The Russians are too strong on, on this front, and we're losing the battle in the rest, in the rest of Europe. So you're going to have to find uh, a way to get out and you should go to Sweden. So uh, my grandmother heard those words. That Sabbath at church, everybody was discussing and she told what the German officer had told her. And they all said, yes, we've been told the same thing from the German military that we need to leave because they can't hold on, that the Russian, the communist soldiers will come in and, and finally take hold of Estonia. So... Um, the pastor said, hey, listen, there's a train leaving next week. We can get on that train. It's going to take us to a port city in Germany, and then we can take a boat to Sweden. 
And everybody agreed to do that. But when my grandmother asked what day he was leaving on, they said it's next Sabbath. And my grandmother, being a very, very strict seven-day Adventist, said, um, pray that your flight is neither in the Sabbath nor in winter. So that next Sabbath, she was practically by herself at church. Everybody else had left. A few elderly people were still there. And she sat in church alone because everybody else had taken that train. Well, that night she was very desperate uh, and she started praying very hard. She prayed Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. By Wednesday, she could hear the bombing. The bombing was getting closer to the city of Tallinn. She woke up at about three in the morning. She didn't know what to do. The kids were okay sleeping. There were two ladies living in the apartment, so she knew that they would be taken care of. She went out to walk the streets of Tallinn. And as she was walking the street, she was praying. She said, Lord, you're going to have to get me out of this city. I don't know how. I can't raise my kids in a communist country to know you. You have to get me out of this city. And as she's walking along, she's the only one in the streets. And she's just praying out loud. There's a lady dressed in gray on the other side of the street. And she's walking along. She crosses the street, comes to my grandmother, whose name was Helmi, and says, Helmi, you and your three kids need to get out of the country, correct? Helmi just nods because she has no idea who this lady is. And she says, if you go down to such and such a dock, there's a boat leaving today. Go down there and you will get on that boat. My grandmother was ecstatic. So she turned around and said, wait, I didn't thank the lady. And she turned around instantaneous and the lady had disappeared. So she didn't think any of it, went home, got the kids so by five o'clock in the morning, they're running down to the port. Now, my, my grandfather was a merchant marine. So my grandmother knew every ship in that harbor. Uh, she knew the captains and the captain's wives because they all kept uh, pretty close together. And when she ran down there, as they crested the hill, she could see one lone boat uh, at the end of the dock. But as they crested the hill, she could see that there was about a crowd of 5,000 people waiting to get on this boat that only held around 300 or really packed 500 people. So when she got down there, her heart sank because they, they couldn't, nobody would let them through or let them up front because everybody wanted to be on that boat. So my mother said to, to my grandmother, said, let's go around that building. So they ran around the building thinking they could bypass some of the people. They ran around the building and they found themselves separated by eight feet of water from this pier to that pier. And my grandmother prayed, she said, Lord, you're going to have to get us across and I don't know how you're gonna do that. Just then a very large German soldier tapped her on the shoulder and said, ma'am, can I help you? She goes, yes, I need to get on that side. He goes, no problem. I'm gonna throw you guys across. He threw my aunt eight years old across. He threw my mother eight, uh, nine years old. And then he threw my uncle, which was about 13, 14. He was a bigger guy across. Now, my, my grandmother was a bigger lady. She wasn't small. And she closed her eyes to have him throw her a clock cross. She didn't feel anything. She opened her eyes and she was on the other side at the dock. So, you know, this was happening so fast that she didn't have time to process what had just happened. So they, they tried moving forward, but nobody would let them through. They had uh, about 3,000 people behind them now and about 2,000 in front. And so my grandmother took the kids together and said, Lord, you parted the Red Sea. Could you part these people so we can get on that boat? And so once she prayed that, uh, my aunt and, and, and mother were the first to head down. And as they started walking through the crowd, guess what the crowd started to do? Remember, this is a crowd that's trying to get on the last boat out before the communist soldiers invade the city of Tallinn. It was it was tight, but as they walked down that pier, the people started to move for them. They got right up to the boat, and there were soldiers uh, guarding the boat and ropes parting it off. Well, my grandmother ducked underneath the rope to get on, and the German soldiers pushed her back. She tried another place, and they pushed her back. There were German guard dogs there, and they were barking, and so they had guns pointed at them. So my grandmother collected her family again and said, Lord, at one time in the Bible, you blinded some soldiers. Could you blind these soldiers so that we can get on the boat? She sent uh, Lillian, my, my aunt, underneath the rope. 
She walked up in the gangplank, got onto the boat, followed by my mother, followed by my, my uncle, and then followed by her. Not a dog bark, not a soldier touched her or saw her. And they got on that boat. As soon as they got on the boat, my, my grandmother heard her name being called. Hell me, hell me. She turned around and it was the captain's wife. The captain's wife said, go down. The boat is crowded. It is overcrowded. Go down to the boat and wait in the very bottom of it. And do not leave whatever you hear on the announcement. Now that boat was going to Sweden. So they went down. They went down to the bottom of the boat. And sure enough, it was packed. But it wasn't packed with people. It was packed with trunks, suitcases, world possessions that people had, and a few people down there, but the, you know, the suitcases and everything were in the bunks, and there was nowhere for them. And so they heard an announcement over the PA, and they said, this boat is no longer going to Sweden, it's going to Germany. And all of a sudden, the people down there started to panic, and they said, we don't want to go to Germany. So they started taking their suitcases, their trunks, and moving them off the boat because the captain wanted people on to get out, not suitcases. And as they saw a bunk open up, my grandmother and her, her kids filled that bunk and they waited and they waited. And when she found, heard the engines roaring and they could, she could tell they were going out to more open waters because she could feel the waves of the boat. They left their suitcases there and they went up there. Nobody was gonna be on it in there. And they went up to the top to find the captain's wife. The captain's wife said, listen, we needed to lighten the boat from all the luggage that was on there. And we needed to rescue more people um, since we're the, probably the only boat getting out today. We're not going to Germany. We are indeed going to Sweden. And so my, my, my mother and her, my aunt, my uncle, and my grandmother were able to get to Sweden and um, eventually came to Canada here uh, to make the rest for, uh, uh, residents as refugees after they had spent a few years in Sweden. Uh, but it was it was it was on my grandmother's knee telling me those stories that stuck in my head that when we pray, God is going to do amazing things in our, our lives. Now He might not do what we want, but whatever He does, it's what's best for us. And and, and I always tell people this: people, picture yourself under the tree of life a few million years from now. That when we're sitting there together as a group. Um, and we're trying to remember what went on and the difficulties we had on this earth, we're going to have a hard time remembering because we have just experienced the glory of God, the love of God, the glory of Jesus over all those years. And when we try to look back at the difficulties or the illnesses or the death that we probably experienced of, you know, my family, my, my mother passed away, my father passed away, my brother passed away. I'm the only one left of my family. But you know what? I know that there's a resurrection and I know that there's eternity ahead of us on the earth made new. And so that's where I keep my focus. And I know that that's going to take, uh, God's going to take care of us. And my wife and I have practiced praying and relying on God in amazing ways. Um, I, I just have story after story of God's providence of taking care of us as a family. When, when we thought that there was no hope, no possibility for anything to work out, lo and behold, at the last minute, God says, here's my plan. Watch what I can do. And we just have incredible experiences where God has done amazing things for us, where we, we you know, uh, I remember we were living in, in Toledo, Ohio, and we were moving back to, for me to teach back at Crawford Events Academy. And uh, we were selling our house and um, we had it listed for $90,000, actually $92,000. We had prayed, Lord, if you want us to move back and we have your blessing to move back. We knew he wanted to, but we were just putting out an extra fleece test. Um, nothing happened. People came and said, you will be lucky to get $60,000 for your house. I, I know we're talking about low prices for houses. Uh, prices have since increased in Canada. But in Toledo, Ohio, that was, um, we didn't live in a good area. The day of our hope, open house, the SWAT team closed down our road uh, because there was a guy down the road with a gun threatening to, to shoot everybody. So we didn't live in a good area. But uh, as we went on, we lowered the house, the price of the house to 87500 And I said, Lord, we ask you to sell the house for 90000 as a sign that you're going to be with us as we're going to be going forward going back to Crawford, going back to Ontario to teach. 
And uh, I said, if you would have sold it for 90, I would have given the entire profit we made from the house to you, Lord. I said that in my prayer closet. So um, time went on. I started teaching at Crawford. My wife stayed down in Toledo. And so one night she was praying. We had lowered the house to 87500 which was lower than $90,000, which we said was our, our fleece test. And my wife was praying. She said, Lord, why didn't you sell the house? And in the room, our kids were sleeping. They were, you know, uh, three and uh, one year old. In, in, in the house, she heard a voice saying, Sonia, give me the money. And my wife started crying because when she hears a voice in the house, and it sounds like the voice of God, uh, she started crying. That was her natural reaction. And she said, Lord, Paul and I are faithful with our tithes and offerings. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we've lowered the house, but Lord, you know, what are you asking for? Uh, and he said, Sonia, give me the money and I'll sell the house. And she said, Lord, we're faithful with our tithes. And what, what are you asking for? And the voice came back again. Give me the profit you make from the house and I will sell the house for $90,000. My wife said, because I promised this in the prayer closet, my personal prayer closet, didn't tell her about it. And she said, Lord, if you sell the house for $90,000, I will make sure we will give you the profit we make on the house to you. And the next day, a doctor walked into our house. She had just graduated from medical school. and She needed a place for her and her three dogs. And she walked into the house. She said, I love this house. And said, what are they asking for it? They said, 87500 she said, nope, this house is worth $90,000, and that's what I'm going to pay for it. And my wife called me up, and she said, Paul, if we needed to give the profit to the Lord that we make on this house after we pay off our mortgage, would that be okay with you? And I'm literally looking up and going, Lord, I promised you that. How in the world did you tell my wife the same thing that I told you? And so I said, Sonia, whatever God needs, he can have. And she says, we just got an offer for $90,000. And we moved back. Uh, the Lord told my wife where to give the money. We gave it. The next Monday, the church called us up at College Park Church and said, did you make a mistake on the check you wrote? Because this is a large sum of money. And she said, no, we didn't make a mistake uh, on that. We gave it. We came back with nothing. And I, and I tell you people, my wife and I have had no issues with housing after we gave away our basically deposit to buy another house um, because that God has just made sure he has taken care of us over and over and over again. So I want to tell you today, people, when we pray, God goes to work. Might not be exactly what we are looking for for the answer, but when we look back a year or two later, when we look at back at God's leading through that, through that time, we will see the hands and feet of God working on our behalf through that time. So trust God. Trust God that God will do, uh, that he will take care of his people. We're his children. He loves to take care of his children. He's not a, a, a God that has his foot, uh, fist clenched at his kids. He's a God that has his arms open for his children. And he can't wait for us to come back. And I have a feeling that when Jesus returns, he's not coming back alone. I don't think our Heavenly Father wants to miss that opportunity to see the world, uh, those that have wanted to be with Jesus, resurrected, those that are alive, raised off the ground. I don't think he wants to miss that opportunity uh, to do that. He cannot wait to have us back with him a thousand years in heaven, but on the earth made new. Anyways, that's that's my 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 what I wanted to share with you today uh, for prayer meeting is that we have a mighty and powerful God that loves us. If God's people would just pray, uh, what amazing things would happen? I, I was listening to a church in Australia that had gone down to a membership of four. They sent a brand new pastor there, right out of Avondale, and they said, "You're pastoring that church. Listen, we're going to close it down in a year, but just do your best." And he went there. Everybody was over the age of, um, I think, 80 in the church, except him and his wife. And so he met every morning at 7 o'clock with those. Out of the three people that came uh, daily, uh, sorry, out of the four people that came daily for that there, three had the early onset of Alzheimer's. 
So there was one that actually would remember the prayers. All they did was pray. Within one year, they had a church of over 65 people, with the majority being under the age of 40 in that church. They have no idea how that happened. All they did was they started to pray and said, Lord, we don't know how to reach these people, but you're going to have to do that. And so I really believe if God's people become praying people, um, you know, praying for our schools, that, that we will have young people coming there to hear the good news of the gospel, praying for our churches. If we just prayed, God would do amazing things in our own lives, but especially in the life of the church. I think that uh, well, one of my questions was, what's the message of the hour? And I think you hit on it. Prayer, big time. Yes. Yeah, and uh, as you're talking about, um, you know, the exciting things that God has done for you through your life, the, uh, Jeremiah 32, 27 comes to mind. Mm -hmm. where he says, I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? During the, during the, the height of COVID, um, I spent a lot of time searching through my Bible about explaining who God was. You know, this, that he's this enormous God, that nothing is impossible. And in my mind, I'm awake at night. I'm thinking like, wow, Lord, that is, that's tremendous. Like you, you are beyond comprehension. How do we explain such a big God? So um, it encouraged our hearts to, that we have to really reach out. And you know, if we know how to give good gifts to our children, don't you think a, a, a perfectly loving father knows how to give good gifts to his kids? And I'm, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel, which, Lord, I want a brand new car. Or something like right. that. But I mean gifts that take care of us as a people. I really believe uh, that the stories of Daniel, that the stories that are in the book of Daniel are for our experience during the last days. That God is saying, hey, listen, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They walked into a fiery furnace. And they walked out of there. And while they were there, Jesus was there with them. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus is a good shepherd that always goes before us. When Daniel walked into the lion's den, or was thrown in the lion's den, I really believe that Jesus was there too. Whatever we go through, Jesus has promised to be with us. And he's going to take care of us. And I, I, I love those stories in, in the book of Daniel. Because I think God is telling us, well, the days that are coming ahead are going to get more difficult. But as they get difficult, just like my grandmother, he's going to take care of his people through that mm -hmm. time. Even, even when we go through uh, uh, such heavy storms, you know, uh, I always think about that story in the New Testament where Jesus is in the boat, he's sleeping. And there's yeah. such a raging storm going on around the disciples. And I mean, they're looking at the waves that are just coming over the boat and the water's filling up and they're going, you know, they think you're going to die. Yeah. I always look at that, how that is the most wonderful picture of peace with mm -hmm. Jesus in the boat Yeah, in any storm. Uh, I just want to appreciate the pastor, Pastor Paul. Uh, thank you for, I came, I joined um, the, uh, the meeting lately. Uh, I mean, during the, the course of the program. Uh, I, I, but I had something that is very thrilling to my heart. And... Uh, I have been in the youth, young people ministry, particularly public campus ministry, yes. uh, back home in Nigeria. And uh, it's very thriving over there and it's very robust and very, uh, it's very wonderful there. Um, yes. I've had time to work with uh, uh, Pastor Jiwon Moon, who was the, um, the, the global GC uh, PCM director. Yes. Uh, I hosted him in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, it's, been, it's a booming. So booming um, ministry back yes. home. Uh, I don't know. I'm wondering how this tied to your vision for the young people because it is apparently that um, there's like a big gap between the the generation, the older generation, the senior generation, and the the the, the little children or the children. There's a big gap. A lot of our young people are out of out of the church. Um, and it's cheering to me to hear in this conversation that you mentioned that as part of your vision. I want to see how that is, is that going to tie it up with uh, uh, the vision, the young people in the campuses, because most of these young people they are still in the campuses. Yes. I don't know whether the, 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 the conference have program, you know, or peace, uh, public campus ministry 
department that look at these young people in the campuses. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we, we're actually, the North American Division is coming to Ottawa, Ontario for their Adventist Christian Fellowship um, Convention. Um, the, it's just been announced. I don't know the date exactly, uh, but um, Ottawa has a very, and in fact, all of Ontario, the Ontario Conference has a very robust uh, Adventist Christian Fellowship network. And I love Adventist Christian Fellowship because um, I would like to see more and more churches come out of Adventist Christian Fellowship because I feel that that is the um, the closest uh, type of church that we need to be replicating, where young people get together, or old people get, doesn't matter, matter, they get together and they just get to know Jesus together. It's social, it's spiritual, it's uplifting, and where we do have um, Adventist Christian Fellowship networks in our schools, and, and in Ontario, it is very widespread. Um, but, uh, and the other place that it's um, done very well is British Columbia, uh, with Nina Lim, uh, when Lena was running um, Adventist Christian Fellowship for the BC Conference, it was very strong. It's kind of died down a little bit because it takes a leader to do that. Uh, but we are looking at working with Adventist Christian Fellowship in being a part of planting these young adult churches um, for them. Our young adults that are out there, we, we think that we want to bring them back to church the way we do church. But our young adults need something totally different. Uh, we all we, we love our church buildings and we love our church programs, but those don't necessarily reach people um, that are secularly minded. And so we have to use different methods to reach them. And we have to have groups that function differently than what a normal church would function in. So you're not going to have an 11 o'clock service. You might have brunch at two o'clock Sabbath afternoon and your house will be full with people. Yeah. So like, like it's happening in Vancouver right now for the Chinese community at uh, University of Vancouver, uh, uh, BC, UBC there. Perfect, so, absolutely. Sounds are, so good. Yeah. We, are, we are making the plans. It is, it's part of it. Um, this coming Monday, uh, Cyril, Millett, Cyril Millett, who's at Camp Hope right now with the uh, workers' meetings, uh, myself and Paul Musafili, the, the treasurer, we're meeting for about five or six hours to pray for how we're going to bring um, a vision of evangelism back to our church here in Canada. So we're praying for us. So I ask you to pray for us on Monday while we're working and we're thinking and we're looking at how to uh, especially plant young adult churches. Because if we plant the young adult churches, the youth come with it. It's a natural result. And young adult churches, as they grow within a five years, they become family churches. So that we're always planting new churches uh, for, for our young people. Because young people bring a vibrant life to our church. And it's wonderful to see it. The church in LaSalle, a new life church that I went to in Montreal, it was so invigorating to be there with, with the, um, the, the young people on Sabbath. I was just blown away. I loved every minute of it. Uh, the, the singing was vibrant, the faith of the people was on fire, and there were many visitors in that church that just walked off the street to come to that church. So and that's what amazed me. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. But thank you. Thanks. We are working on that. And Adventist Christian Fellowship has an important part to play. Uh, we're just waiting for the, uh, the North American Division to help guide us through that because um, some of our conferences, uh, when I was in the Maritime Conference, do you know what my youth budget was per year? $1,500 as a youth director. That was my budget to do youth ministries for a full year in the Maritime Conference. So some of our conferences really struggle because the resources are not there. And, uh, you know, we're only graduating two pastors this year from Berman University for a for about 15 to 20 openings so we have a lack of uh, people wanting to go into ministry so pray for that pastor it's, uh, it's another prayer request that i want you to when possible to bring to the union we are yes. embarking into building a new church for several years now 
Excellent. And has been a long journey, but uh, we want to basically become the number one destination from people to find Jesus here in Victoria. Wonderful. When people Thank think you. about a life change, a connecting with God, that the first thing that comes to their minds is, this church is offering something more than just Bible study. They offer me a connection with God. So if you can pray for that to become a reality, you know, when sometimes when you have time in the union, we yes. have built a vision with Pastor Miriam. I don't know if you know Pastor Miriam. Yes, I do. He, yes, I do. he has been a wonderful leader for us. And, um, and uh, we got a good team of elders and leaders in our church. The church is a very beautiful church. And you will feel it the time you come and visit. But uh, pray for that when you can in uh, the union, because we really want to minister this, this city, to serve this city the way that it's time to change things around here. Ah, awesome. Great news. And I do hear words all the way from the Western Canada to the Eastern Canada uh, of what God is doing in, in, uh, through your church and through the other churches, too, in, uh, there in uh, Victoria. So uh, God, God's working. People, God, God's working in our church. Um, even if we, we think, Lord, nothing's happening. Everybody's like they're sleeping. God's still doing something. And even if there's only four people left in the church, like the one in Australia, God will do something when we pray and say, God, we give up. We can't do it. You're going to have to do it for us. Dear Holy Father, it is such a pleasure that... Um, in this tiny planet, in this large universe, your ear is tuned to us. And Lord, not just us, but the millions of people that are praying right now. Even people that, Lord, like, like Nebuchadnezzar, who prayed to his God, Nebu, and the God of heaven answered his prayer. So Lord, even for people that don't know who they're praying to, Jesus, I ask you to answer their prayer that they will come to know the God of heaven like Nebuchadnezzar did. And Lord, um, we, we love to bring our prayer requests to you because when we give our, our deepest needs to you, uh, you take them, Lord, and, and you work on them even before we even ask. But because, Lord, you love us and you care for us, your, your children. And Lord, we are so injured and, and, and stained with sin but Jesus, you came to give up everything, to die on the cross so that your blood could wash away our sins. So Lord, I ask you right now to wash us clean, make us so much like you, and that Lord, thank you for tuning your ear to our prayers, and that Lord, um, your heart is tuned to what we're going through, and you care for us deeply, and you can't wait for us to be home, and, and you know that Lord, that this world is just spiraling, spiraling downhill uh, in a sinful state of condition. So Lord, inspire your people to go to share the good news to this world that desperately needs you. It is going crazy out there. But Lord, your people will have peace. I know the three angels message, it says there's no peace day or night for those that worship the beast. But Lord, for your people, there's peace. I pray that you will show this peace, Lord, to our neighbors, to our friends, to the people that we meet uh, while we're shopping, and that, Lord, that they will see you. Today, Lord, we want to bring our prayer requests uh, to you. We want to pray for Lovetta, whose husband just passed away unexpectedly, that you will be with her and watch over her, the neighbor of Jake. And Lord, we want to pray for Evelyn T, for healing for her, that you will watch over her and wrap your arms around her. Um, and also for a smooth move for Claudia. Uh, Lord, you, you, you do so much for us, not just great things, but also, Lord, things to make things smooth for us. So we're asking for a smooth move, uh, Lord. Uh, we want our, to pray for our children, Lord. Every single person, um, parent, worries about their children, and even not only our children, but others. And so, Lord, right now, Satan thinks he's doing a marvelous job of trying to take them away from you. But Jesus, you will have the last word. Uh, just like you brought my father to you and my brother to you and me to you and my mother back to you, I know that you will bring our children back to you. Lord, when you come, do not let our kids be missing 
from raising off the ground to meet you in the air. Do not let our relatives be missing, and Lord, don't let our neighbors be missing from that experience. Lord, use us to reach other people. Use us to reach our kids, but Lord, if we can't, you, through the Holy Spirit, do that work in their hearts. We want to pray for the health of um, our school, Lord, our staffers, uh, for Sarah Kay and for Scott Carby. Uh, we pray that, Lord, you will fill the school uh, with those that who desire to know you and for God to equip it to provide for his ministry uh, and for a ring of fire to protect that school, Lord. I pray for our teachers, our workers there. I pray for Scott, who leads that school, that, Lord, you will just pour out your Holy Spirit on all of them as they minister to those kids. As even if we don't see those hearts of the kids changing, Lord, something is happening in their home because of what is happening in the classroom. So I pray, Lord, through the ministry of our schools that many will come to know you through them. I pray for our also, Lord, for our pastors, our lay people, our leaders in the church, those that teach Sabbath school, those that uh, that, that do work of, of making sure that there's no hungry person in our community. Lord, be with them. Be with all our members, Lord, and, and, and raise us up because, uh, Lord, we're so busy being busy. I pray that, Lord, we will have time to share uh, the gospel message, even if it's just... Uh, baking some something for somebody that's going through a hard time or just a kind word or just you know, a hand upon somebody that hasn't had a hand holding for a long time. We ask that you will do that. We want to pray for uh, Lorna's good friend who is hurting and may the Holy Spirit work on her and come back to the Victoria Church once again with forgiveness in her heart. Lord, so many of us hold so many hard things in our heart. But I pray, Lord, that as you touch them, those things that we hold that are hard, that are hurting, will disappear. So Lord, soften all of our hearts. Soften um, Lorna's friend's heart so that she will come back. And Lord, we pray for Evelyn Tony for healing in her life so that you will do an incredible work. But Lord, if at times you do things that are contrary to what our wishes, our desires are. I know that in heaven, as Ellen White says, we will not regret Brett, the way you have led us on this earth. So if we won't regret that in heaven, then whatever happens on this earth, Lord, you are orchestrating, you are involved with, you are, are caring for us. So that, Lord, even if death knocks on our doorstep and we might have to sleep for a few years in the dust of the earth, Remember, we have millions and billions of years ahead of us on the earth made new. So, Lord, we thank you for what you will do um, by raising our loved ones to life. We thank you for what you will do to bring our young kids, our, our, our youth, our, our kids that we have raised, Lord, that might not walk with you. We, we thank you for bringing them to the resurrection, Lord. Um, I'm thinking ahead of time because, Lord, I'm picturing in my mind of our kids, our, our relatives, our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies raising off the ground to meet you in the air. Lord, you said the harvest is great, so that means there must be a lot of people that are turning their hearts to you that we cannot see. And it says to pray for laborers to, to help with the harvest, but Lord, even if there's no laborers, I know your angels will do that work. No one will be left behind on this earth, Lord, uh, because there was nobody to harvest them. Lord, you'll reach everybody. You'll do everything you can to change the hearts of those that we're praying for. So, Lord, as a people, I pray that we will learn to, to reach out to our communities, to reach our neighbors, to reach our friends, and to pray for those that their hearts will turn to you and know the wonderful Lord that we know and be waiting for you when you come again. In your name I pray, amen.